Hello, students. Welcome back to Mr. Lahan's AP European History class. Today, we're going to talk about the culmination of the entire chapter, all right? All of this, and culmination means like the end game, all right, of this entire chapter. And that is a very big revolution is about to happen because of all of this colonial fighting. These trade wars are all going to just end up with the American Revolution. Now, this is not like the, the, the revolution in European history, okay? You'll find out on the very last episode of the notes, 8.6, you'll find out that the American Revolution may not have had the effect on Great Britain that you think it had. But it is a big one in the history of not only the United States, but also in the history of Europe and the world. So today, we're going to talk about 8.5, what were the causes of the American Revolution? Pause if you need to. Well, if you've been with us through uh, all of chapter eight, you can probably see this one coming. As a matter of fact, there's been several times where I've said, hey, this is going to cause the American Revolution. All right. So let's talk about some background first. The background, the underlying causes of the American Revolution. You know, it's interesting. I talk about in my African American history class, and when I used to teach AP US history, I would ask my students, why were the American colonies founded? Why did Great Britain start the colonies? And every American probably has a different uh, answer. But the problem with most Americans is they say, oh, uh, America was founded on religious toleration. We wanted to be able to practice our religion freely. Or some people might say America was founded uh, to create a democracy. Well, guys, that's not really true, all right? And the truth is every colony was founded for a different reason, and they were all kind of founded haphazardly, which means there was no real true rhyme or reason. For instance, Jamestown, the first colony, was started by a company called the Virginia Company, uh, the, the Joint Stock Company of Virginia, and their goal was to find gold. You know what they found? Starvation and death. And I guess eventually they found tobacco uh, is worth a lot of money to Europeans. So they eventually learned to grow tobacco, but they were not in it for religious freedom. They were in it for money. A little bit further north, sure, you could say the Puritans that were fleeing England from the uh, persecutions of like Elizabeth uh, and other people that were persecuting Puritans, they came here to practice their religion freely, but it wasn't like all of America was founded on religious freedom, because if you didn't agree with the Puritans, you got kicked out of their colonies. Uh, some colonies were founded because kings owed money to people like William Penn, and they were like, hey, can I just give you some land in America? So bottom line is all of these all of these colonies were founded for for a lot of different reasons and there's not one unifying reason why the American colonies were founded in the first place. Now, all of these colonies were ruled by Great Britain as a matter of well or England at the time, all right? Uh but all of these colon colonies were ruled by British laws, all right? Uh, that's true. And all of these guys looked at themselves as British citizens or English citizens. But at the same time, as soon as people stepped foot on the shores of America, they started to have their own rules. For instance, uh, in Virginia, they had uh, the, um, the House of Burgesses, which was a lawmaking body of Virginia. The Mayflower, when they came over... Uh, when they came over, they already had the Mayflower Compact, which was rules to kind of govern what eventually ended up being the Massachusetts Bay Colony. So everybody had this idea that when they got here, they were going to make up their own rules and have their own little governments. So just the fact that you kind of had your own colonial assembly and your own way of making laws for yourself kind of set yourself up for, we don't really have to do what the British say. We've got our own lawmaking body. But at the same time, they did consider themselves English citizens. Now, some of those laws that governed the American colonies were navigation laws. And these were laws that very much, like we've talked about in all colonial empires, said very said things like, you know what, no smuggling is allowed. You have to trade with the mother country and the mother country only. And uh, you have to you have to transport goods on British approved ships that have to land in British ports under British control, all of these things, because the British wanted to have a monopoly over American trade. Here's the problem though, guys. Early on, they didn't really enforce these rules. If you want to understand why Americans are angry, the best analogy I can give you is this, or why they're going to be angry. The best analogy I can give you is this. 
Many of us have been in a classroom before where the teacher at the very beginning of the year says, hey, everybody, no cell phones are allowed in class. If I see a cell phone, I am confiscating it and you, your parents will have to come get it. Guys, I don't even know what people do with cell phones. But, um, but anyway, we've all had or seen that teacher at the very beginning of the year set those rules and it's crystal clear. And maybe even for the first week, second week, teachers follow through. They snatch up your phones and they say, you know, these are the rules. But after a while, pretend that that teacher stops caring, you know, or doesn't enforce the rule very much. Pretty soon, student starts to think, well, she's not confiscating or he's not confiscating my phone. I'm going to pull my phone out. And then you do, <gasps> and nothing happens. The teacher doesn't take it. A month passed. The teacher stops confiscating phones. Two months pass. Three months pass. Pretty soon you get comfortable with your teacher not enforcing the rules and you never expect your teacher to enforce the rules. But imagine, guys, after months and even years of not enforcing the rules, let's imagine, guys, after months of not enforcing the cell phone rule, it's December, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, the teacher looks around and says, hey, I said no cell phones. Look at the syllabus. It's clearly in the syllabus. Well, as a student, you might be like, yeah, I get that that's a thing, but you haven't enforced that rule in six months. Why would you do that now? That's kind of what I'm getting at here. Great Britain had all of these laws, but they rarely enforced them. So therefore, the American colonies got used to the idea that, yeah, I know I'm not supposed to trade with other nations, but the British aren't enforcing that law, so I'm going to do that. So guess what? Smuggling was rampant. Why? Because the British never really enforced the laws. But guess what, guys? All of that is about to change. Now, another reason why they weren't enforcing these laws is the British prime minister at the time, by the way, the king is King George III. He is going to be the ruler of Great Britain. I'm sure you've heard of that sometime in your life. He's going to be the ruler of Great Britain um, throughout the American Revolution. But we all know, guys, in Great Britain, there's not an absolute king. King George III rules with Parliament, okay? Parliament makes the laws. King George III is kind of like the executive branch. So Robert Walpole is like the next guy down under the king that kind of makes sure the king gets his ideas out there. He's kind of the head of state. And he's the British prime minister. And he has, it was his idea to kind of have this hands-off policy towards the colonies, all right? So I want to teach you a phrase. It's called salutary neglect, and it, you might see it on an AP test. You might see it reading an AP book or a history book, but all salutary neglect is, it's this idea that Great Britain has all of these laws, but because the colonies are, you know, a long ways away, and because you are involved in all of these things going on in continental Europe, you don't really check up on the colonies, and they kind of learn to do their own thing. You are neglecting enforcing the rules. Okay? So that's the situation. There's 13 colonies, and they have this idea that they are under British law, but the British never enforce these laws, so they rule themselves and they take care of themselves. But all that's about to change. Pause if you need to. Okay, let's jump into the causes of the American Revolution, and this is going to last for several slides. So the very first cause, guys, is the Seven Years' War. Now, guys, wars are expensive. During wars, you spend money. During wars, you borrow money from people and promise to pay them back after the war. But bottom line is the Seven Years' War put Great Britain into a lot of debt. Boy, if you think Great Britain's in debt, wait till we talk about the French, which also helps lead to the French Revolution. Another thing is this. Great Britain got a huge chunk of change when it comes to the territories that they got from the Seven Years' War and the French and Indian War. I don't know why my pictures aren't popping up. But bottom line is Great Britain got all of this land all the way to the Mississippi River. So Great Britain pretty much doubled the size of their colonial empire. And you know what, guys? That takes money to control because then you have to send troops in order in that new area in order to survey the new area, to protect the new area from future Native American lands. Because even though the French and their Native American allies were defeated in the Seven Years slash French and Indian War in America, the Native Americans are still there and the British still consider them a threat. So what do they do? They send a whole bunch of British troops in order to protect the American colonies from future Native American raids. But here's the problem with that. Now you've got to pay for all those troops to live there. So 
Great Britain's already in debt after the war. Now they're in more debt because they've got all this land that they have to protect. So how does Great Britain make up all of this money that they lost? And the answer, guys, how do you ever make up any amount of lost money in government is you pass taxes or you start enforcing taxes that you've never enforced. So the British government decided, first of all, all of those trade laws that should never be enforced, you know what? We should start enforcing those laws. Now think about it. If you're a student in class and you've been allowed to have your cell phone for six, seven, eight, nine months and the teacher never cared anything about it and all of a sudden the teacher's going to start enforcing that law, how's that going to make you feel? You might be like, WTH, what the heck? Like, why are you doing this? What's wrong with you? You can't do this. I've had my cell phone all year. And you might start getting riled up and you might start getting angry. Well, guys, the colonies are going to start doing the same thing. What the heck? Why are you enforcing all these laws that you've never enforced before? We've been doing this for years. And guess what else the British are going to start saying? You know what? American colonies, you belong to us and you haven't really been paying your fair share of taxes. All right? So the British are going to make the colonies and they're going to believe the colonies are going to start uh, or should pay more taxes to bring in more revenue. Now, revenue, guys, is a fancy word for saying government income, how the government makes money. How does government get revenue or income, guys? Taxes. It's also a way that politicians like to try to deceive uh, ignorant people and they say, we need to raise revenue. And ignorant people are like, yeah, that's a great idea. Translation, we need to raise taxes, all right? A lot of people will sign on a bill that raises revenue and then they get angry when their taxes go up. Well, what do you think was going to happen? You raise revenue by raising taxes. Anyway, guys, there you go. All right, now, George Grenville. He is a position in Great Britain called the Chancellor of the Exchequer. All right. Now, what is the Chancellor for the Exchequer? That's a fancy word. What does that mean? It means you're pretty much the treasurer of Great Britain. So George Grenville, this guy right here, is the treasurer of Great Britain, and he's trying to raise money for the British. So guess what he does? He says, you know what? We are going to start taxing their sugar. Now, taxing their sugar. Okay. Well, here's the deal, guys. Maybe maybe I didn't explain this very well in mercantilism. But remember we talked about the colonies exist to give raw materials to Great Britain. Well, they don't give raw materials to Great Britain. They sell raw materials to Great Britain. So they sell sugar and they sell things that uh, sugar makes. All right. Uh, like rum. Sugar is used to make rum. Sugar is used to make molasses. Uh, sugar is used to make other dispil distilled spirits too. So bottom line is, England starts saying, let's tax them when they sell stuff to us. It's called an import. Let's pass a tax on sugar. Okay? Now, another thing they did was they said, let's start cutting down on smuggling. And this is all George Grenville's idea. If we tax sugar, that'll bring in some money. And if we start cutting down on smuggling, that will also bring in some money. Now, these are going to be the beginning of a wave of taxation that's going to cause fights between Great Britain and the colonies. So pause if you need to, and let's continue talking about these taxes. All right, the big one, the Stamp Act. You might think the Tea Act is, you know, the tea problems are the big one, but it's really the Stamp Act, guys. Now, Guys, one of the things I did when I was working on my master's degree is I did a paper on the causes of the American Revolution. And I can tell you, most historians say the causes of the American Revolution, the really big turning point, and where Great Britain might have made their worst mistake was right here. Okay? The Stamp Act. All right, so what is the Stamp Act? Well, literally, guys, it's something that people in England already paid. Every newspaper or every legal document that was printed had to pay a tax, and you would get a stamp on the document showing that a tax had been paid. All right? So it was a tax on all legal documents and all newspapers. Who's that going to hurt? Well, people that need a legal document and uh, people that read newspapers and people that make newspapers. All right. Uh, so anyway, guys, that's who it hits. Okay. Now, like I said, not a big deal and not even really an expensive tax, but it wasn't the amount of money on the tax. It was more like the fact that they were being taxed on this at all. You see, Britain considered these taxes legal. Why? Because Parliament passed them. Any law that Parliament passes on Great Britain or its colonies is a legal tax. And it was fair. All right. Why? Because, hey, 
the Americans need to pay for all of these troops that we stationed in order to protect them. Now, I'll be honest with you guys, if you're an American colonist, you don't see these British troops coming across into your colonies as protection. You see them as an invading army. Plus, guys, another thing they said was in order to save money, American uh, families would have to house and quarter those troops, which means either pay for their housing or put troops up in their own homes and feed them. Why? Cut down on the cost. So as you can imagine, guys, if you're an American colonist, all these British soldiers are coming over here, it looks like an invading army, and now the British are taxing you. Now, what were colonial thoughts on these besides what I just told you? Well, number one, colonies believed that only their assemblies were allowed to tax them. They're like, look, we get that we're British citizens, but I've got my own colonial assembly here in my colony. They're the ones that pass laws for my specific colony. All right. They would look and say, we don't even have a representative for us that sets on British parliament. So it's not fair under English law that you tax us when we don't even have a representative on parliament. So guys, that's another thing about English law. In order to tax somebody and have it legal, well, technically, your area had to have a representative that was a member of parliament. Well, guys, the British didn't consider colonies needing a representative. So the British are like, well, you don't need a representative. You're our colonies. You'll do what we say. And American colonies were like, look, you can't tax us without having a representative. So this is where the famous phrase, no taxation without representation comes from. They say, look, until you put a member of parliament from the American colonies on parliament, we don't have to pay your taxes. And the British fire back, yes, you do. So guess what the Americans do? They get together and they form this thing called the Stamp Act Congress. Now, what's a Congress, guys? It's just a gathering of people to get together. So a whole bunch of people from uh, from the different colonies get together and they're like, what can we do to not pay this tax? All right. They're taxing us without our consent. They're taxing us out without representation. And they agreed to boycott. Boycott means stop buying British goods. Now think about mercantilism. Who is Great Britain's biggest customer that buys all their goods? The American colonies. And if they stop buying British goods, where is that going to hit Great Britain? Right in their wallets. It's a brilliant move, guys. And guess what? When the British hear that the Americans are going to boycott all their goods, this is where historians say that Great Britain made a big mistake. Guess what, guys? They repealed the Stamp Act. Now, let me ask you guys something, all right? I'm a parent. I've got two small children. If my kid, if I tell my kid a rule, hey, you can't have a cookie before dinner, and my child threatens to scream and yell and and cause a fit and do all these things, if I don't give them a cookie, and I panic, and I back down, guess what I just taught my child? That I can be made to back down. So think about it, guys, the most powerful country in the world, your mother country, tells you, you've got to pay this tax. You scream and yell, you threaten to boycott their goods, and they back down. What did Great Britain just show the colonies? They showed them that the most powerful nation in the world will back down if you scream loud enough. So guys, it showed weakness, all right? Now, in order to kind of counteract that, Great Britain did pass these acts called the Declaratory Act, which said... But from now on, we're going to back down from this Stamp Act, but from now on, when we pass a tax, we mean it. Kind of like the parent that after they get uh, threatened by their kid says, okay, I'll let you get away with it, but next time I'm serious, right? We've all had those parents and we look at them like, yeah, right, I own you now. And that's kind of how the Americans felt. For 10 years, guys, this pattern is going to get repeated. Parliament's going to pass a tax, colonists are going to get angry, then Parliament's going to back down. All right. And every time Parliament shows weakness, it makes the American colonies even more bold. Pause if you need to. All right. Trouble. Guys, we got trouble, my friends. I say we got trouble right here in River City. You guys have probably never seen the musical The Music Man. But anyway, that's a song from that. OK, well, guys, guess who else is going to jump into this mix? There's this group, guys, in Boston called the Sons of Liberty. Now, the Sons of Liberty are a bunch of young-ish men in their 20s, uh, and they're a rowdy group led by this guy named Sam Adams. And guess what, guys? Sam Adams and the Sons of Liberty go around, and they kind of cause trouble. They harass tax collectors from the British and, and things like that. And these guys are going to start a lot of problems in 
Boston, okay? As a matter of fact, guys, when you see most of the things that we think about in the American Revolution, they happen in Boston, okay? So this is where things are going to get kind of out of control and out of hand, all right? So imagine these guys, these troublemakers are going around and every time Great Britain does something, they either rough up a tax collector or they might tar and feather a tax collector or harass them. And then guys, they go around and cause mobs and they shout, we're not going to pay British taxes, grr. You know, all this anger and they spread all this anger towards Great Britain. Well, guys, Charlie Townsend is, becomes the new Chancellor of the Exchequer, and guys, he passes more taxes. And he gets the idea of, I'm going to send British soldiers into the colonies, like Boston especially, with those troublemakers, and I'm going to have them make sure that our tax collectors are protected. So imagine if you're Boston, here are more soldiers showing up. Now, if you're a British soldier, you don't really make a lot of money. So one of the things that you do is you try to get little side jobs. Well, in the town of Boston, guess what happened? Uh, soldiers trying to get a little side job on the side, uh, you know, cause problems with these workers. All right. In Boston and American workers already riled up by the Sons of Liberty and already riled up by the newspapers. Uh, one night. Well, actually, a couple nights. It starts on a Friday, and there's a fight between soldiers and workers on the docks. And this spills over three days later into um, a hairdresser accuses a soldier and says, Hey, your uh, captain or general, I forget what it was, your captain didn't pay for my... Um, my my boss's services. And what happens is the British soldier is like, how dare you insult my captain, takes the butt of his gun and smash it into the mouth of this American worker. Well, guys, people around saw what happened. And all of a sudden, this British soldier gets surrounded by a whole bunch of Americans screaming, yelling, and harassing and threatening. All right. Now, Captain Preston, the leader of the uh, guards in the area, surrounds the British soldier and tries to calm everybody down and says, look, guys, calm down. But guys, the crowd gets out of hand. They start throwing snowballs. They start shouting at the soldiers saying, I dare you to fire, fire, damn you. Why don't you fire? You won't. You're scared. They start insulting them, calling them lobsters because they have red coats and they call them... Uh, uh, and, their, and their tails look like a lobster tail of their coats, bloody backs. I mean, they call them all kinds of things. And then, guys, one of the Americans strikes a soldier with a gun and it hits him with a three-foot club. The soldier, guys, disarms or discharges his gun. Pretty soon, everybody's firing their guns and five people are killed. The newspapers, guys, spread this picture throughout all the colonies, calling it the Boston Massacre. And boy, do this, does this one event, guys, rile up the colonies. You see, guys, the colonies have these things called committees of correspondence. And there are these little committees set up in every colony. And what their job is, is to spread propaganda. What's propaganda, guys? Basically, information that may or may not be accurate, trying to get you to look at something in a specific way. In this case, this makes it look like the Americans were innocent and were not clubbing British soldiers with three-foot clubs, and it makes it look like the British just randomly opened fire on innocent colonists. Look at the blood. Look at that one dude, the blood bleeding out of that one dude's head. And then as all my students say, oh, look at the poor dog right there. But anyway, it makes the British look like they opened fire on purpose, all right? After the trial in the colonies, uh, uh, the British soldiers were acquitted, and it was shown that they fired in self-defense. But it doesn't matter. That picture convinced everybody right off the bat that the British were cold-blooded murderers. So now, Americans are getting really upset. But, guys, things kind of die down. And then in 1773, once again, in order to raise money, the British hatched this scheme. They say, look, we are going to give the British East India Company a monopoly on American tea. Now, what this means is Americans from now on in the colonies are going to have to buy tea only from the British East India Company. Now, you might be thinking, Great Britain, are you crazy? The Americans are starting to hate you, and now you're going to make them buy tea from you? They're going to lose their minds if you do this. Well, the British thought of that, and here's what they said. They said, we will make sure that it is cheaper than any tea they can buy in the colonies. We're, we're going to make them buy from us, but it's going to be the cheapest tea that they can find. Now, guess what part of that made it into American newspapers? That 
um, the British have to, or the Americans have to buy tea only from the British, or that the tea was going to be cheap. The part about the tea being cheap did not make it into the newspapers, and all Americans saw was, how dare these guys, they're making us buy tea from them. So, guys, guess what happens? The good old Sons of Liberty, these troublemakers led by Sam Adams, board a ship and are board several ships in Boston Harbor. They chop open the ships and they throw the tea overboard, costing King George III and Great Britain about $3 million, which back in the 1770s, guys, would have been a ridiculous amount of money. So at this point, guys, Great Britain, King George III, and Parliament are livid, which means angry beyond control. Pause if you need to. Okay, 1774, Great Britain and Parliament shut down Boston Harbor. They absolutely close it to any trade. Now imagine if you own a business in Boston, you just lost your business because the British shut you down. Now that makes you even angrier. You should have been maybe angry at Sam Adams for doing that in the first place because that's why the British shut down the harbor. But anyway, at this point, uh, we are getting to a place in the American Revolution that is almost beyond beyond going back, all right? And they also said from now on, the English did, from now on, criminals will be tried in Great Britain. We're going to take any criminal arrested in America and try them in Great Britain. Now, if you're an American, you think, well, that's not going to be a fair trial, and it makes you angry. So, guys, guess what happens? Americans call what is known as the First Continental Congress, all right? Now, what is the First Continental Congress? Once again, it's another meeting of, of delegates from the continent. And the whole purpose was, what do we do about the British? Like, what do we do here? Okay. How do we prevent this, this situation from getting out of control and us fighting a war? Now, keep in mind, nobody was really wanting to fight a war right now because Great Britain's the most powerful nation in the world. And to fight a war would be a disaster because we don't even have a continental army. We just have colonial militias. And those are all divided. So one of the first things that people agree to at the First Continental Congress is they're like, look, it's the Enlightenment after all. Let's send a declaration of rights to King George. Let's tell King George, hey, King George, these are our rights. You're violating them. Please stop. All right. Now, I'm sure you can imagine what King George would think of that declaration of rights. But the second thing is they said, look, guys, we need to be ready if the British ever try to come rough us up like the Boston Massacre. So what they agreed to do, agreed to do, what they agreed to do, guys, was to start stashing weapons in different spots throughout Boston. And the idea was, if British troops ever rolled up to cause mischief, then Americans would be able to go grab those weapons at these different storehouses in a minute's notice and be able to fight. Hence the name Minutemen. All right. Now, here's the problem, guys. Stockpiling large amounts of weapons for obvious reasons in your colonies is illegal. And guess what, guys? The British have spies and they know that the Americans are going to start stockpiling weapons. And guess what, guys? They are now going to send troops to stop these Americans from stockpiling weapons. And we're going to stop right here tonight, guys. But that move is going to lead to the beginning of the American Revolution. Guys, that's the end of the notes for tonight. We'll finish this up in our last lesson, 8.6. Everyone, have a good night, and I'll see you in class.